After Brexit, Brussels feeling the blowback against globalization in its own backyard. Belgium's French-speaking Wallonia region so far saying no to the free trade deal the EU was to have approved with Canada this week. Consensus in short supply these days when it comes to open markets. And after Brexit, Wallonia is another example of a Rust Belt economy blowing back against globalization. In the grand scheme, trade agreements with Canada may seem, well, uh, a bit, uh, how, how should we say it, arcane, but that's the point, says the Canadian Prime Minister. If they can't agree on this, uh, Justin Trudeau insists, what can they agree on? Is it the credibility of the whole continent that's at stake? One single region holding sway over 28 nations, soon to be 27. What is the alternative to rule by consensus? What happens when you go down the British path and go your own way? Today in the France Fanquette debate, is the EU project in fact in the balance? We'll be joined from uh, La Louvière in Belgium by the Vice President of Wallonia's Regional Senate Socialist, Olga Zrian. Joining us here in the studio, John Evans, Secretary General of the Trade Union Advisory Committee to the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. Thanks for being with us. Thanks. Thanks as well to entrepreneur Jakob Hessler. Hi, nice to meet you. Welcome back. Uh, uh, from Hania on the Greek island of Crete, economist Yanis Koutsoumidis. And uh, we're also joined uh, from uh, uh, Victoria in British Columbia. He's the former Canadian ambassador to the European Union. Uh, Jeremy Kinsman, welcome to the show. Hi. The France Vent Get to Be, where you can join the conversation, and you have on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 Debate. EU trade ministers were supposed to have uh, signed on the dotted line when it comes to this CETA trade deal before uh, the uh, European Council summit that opens Thursday in Brussels and a planned visit next week by the Canadian Prime Minister. Now all of that is up in the air. Kathy Clifford has more. Win round Wallonia, move forward with the CETA deal and avoid international embarrassment. The agenda of EU ministers meeting within these walls as activists' qualms quite literally hung over them. For now, no solution but a deadline of this Friday for Belgium to come to an agreement with its Wallonia region, which has become the sole force holding back a deal that was seven years in the making. Well, if I didn't think we could solve the Belgian uh, issue, we, we wouldn't keep on engaging with them, of course. A couple of weeks ago, there were other countries who had some specific problems. So, so we are engaging with them the same way, trying to see if there are ways we can solve it without, of course, reopening the, the treaty. That is, that, that, that is not even on, on the agenda. Hopefully, we'll get there, but we're not there yet. The aim behind CETA is to create a common market without customs barriers between the EU and Canada, as well as a reduction in administrative costs for businesses and opening up new agricultural markets. If signed, the deal would be the first between the bloc and a G7 country, and the EU fears its failure would call into question its ability to forge other international trade deals. Its failure would hurt Britain too, with many seeing it as a potential model for the UK's post-Brexit ties. Critics say the deal would give multinational companies greater power than national governments. It's a regressive 20th century deal that we think is going to end up in job losses. It's going to reduce democracy in Europe and Canada. And so we'd like them to rethink this deal. The protest movement's current hero, Paul Magnet, head of government in Belgium's Wallonia region. He's described disguised threats for him to approve the deal and said he wouldn't give way. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is left wondering whether to pack his cases, with officials saying his trip to sign the deal at the end of the month won't go ahead unless Belgium can come to an agreement. All right, and here's what, uh, when the French Prime Minister was in Ottawa last week, uh, Justin Trudeau said, he told reporters, if Europe cannot manage to sign the, this agreement, that sends a very clear message, not just to Europeans, but to the whole world, that Europe is choosing a path that is not productive either for its citizens or for the world, and that would be a shame. John Evans, your reaction to that? I agree with um, Prime Minister Trudeau on most issues, but on that I think he's wrong. I think the problem with the CETA agreement is that it's not so much about trade, and certainly uh, the organisations I represent certainly are in four trade agreements, but it's basically about, uh, as was said in the, in the reporting, giving companies new powers, uh, dealing with the regulation which may be necessary to have a, a well-functioning economy. 
So I think it's much more important to get a, an agreement between Canada and the European Union, which is right, rather than an agreement which is actually seen to give business new powers. Are you, are you saying there's no rush? <clears throat> Yeah, I think it's, it's questions. It's a negotiation, and people are taking positions in that negotiation now. I mean, if uh, that's not surprising, but the issue is really to get, a, particularly in the light of the Brexit negotiations, not simply to say we've got to get another agreement, even if it's a bad agreement, because that shows that can, people can decide on something, because that'll simply come back as a boomerang. I think the essential thing is to get a well-balanced, good agreement. And I, I think the fact that the uh, the Commission has had to come back in the last few days with a uh, with a declaration which is supposed to be interpretive guidance on the agreement, which actually deals with many of the criticisms which have been actually presented on the, on the, original, on the original deal, I think is a sign that the, the process is shifting. Um, we'll see whether that gets done by Friday morning or whether it will be put off and it requires some months to, to actually negotiate. But in that case, I don't think that's a, a drama either. So I would agree with that. I think, I think first thing, I think the EU was right to give the power back to the member states, it had not the legitimacy to conclude that deal by itself, I think, and they were right to not do that. Secondly, I think <clears throat> the, I personally think that most of what's in the agreement seems to me quite useful and from a business perspective, something you would want to ease business with Canada and we're not talking about sort of tyrannic countries with tyrannic corporations, we're talking about Canada after all. But I think the, the issue is about how do you negotiate a trade deal, and I think we lack a bit of imagination. Because what we've seen with TTIP is if you think... TTIP is that deal with the United yeah, States, which if, if right you, now is even more up in the air. So if, and I think if you think that you can, in the 21st century, negotiate a deal secretly over years, and then suddenly in the end present the finally packaged deal and say, now take it or leave it. That doesn't work. And so and I think the lesson learned is, and you can see in the EU, now the ombudswoman of the EU has opened and created more transparency on TTIP. And I think the only way to go forward is to create much more transparency, A, because people can influence the outcome and they can express preferences in the negotiation. And secondly, you have a much greater legitimacy because I think in the, in the content of it, most of it, I think most reasonable people could probably agree with, and then, well, let's haggle about the issues that are really, that are really tough. All right, but, let, let, me bring in, let me bring in uh, Jeremy Kinsman on this. Uh, Jeremy, you've heard our panel here in the studio. They say there's a lot they agree with uh, in the agreement uh, with Canada, but uh, it isn't now or never. Do you agree? You know, we started this in 1972. That was the first uh, trade mission to the Europe of the Six uh, in response to Richard Nixon's unilateral imposition of a 10% surcharge on imports, which hurt us very badly. We started in 1972. Uh, we couldn't negotiate with the Europeans because they couldn't get an act together. In this particular case, it was because France, still in the shadow of Charles de Gaulle, who died, uh, couldn't authorize Brussels to conduct relationships with other countries. That was foreign policy, which stayed in the hands of the member states. Now we're in a position where it is the regional government of Wallonia that is deciding that the 27 countries, minus, of course, Britain, can't conclude what is a deal with Canada which bears no resemblance uh, to the description that was given by your first panelist. This isn't a corporate deal. This is a people-to-people -people deal. This is a 21st century agreement. It's not about goods. It's about attempting to find a way the two highly integrated already by investment economies can also find ways to enable people to go back and forth, professionals, workers, students, scholars, and work in the other country's jurisdiction without being subject to a whole bunch of protectionist and guild exclusions that uh, disqualify them from being an architect or a doctor uh, or an accountant because their courses weren't undertaken in exactly the same way as other courses. It's not about corporations. It's about Canada 
and Europe trying to find a way to work better together, to give virtual recognition to each other's credentials on a basis of equivalency. Of course, it also deals with the regulatory environments. Regulations are extremely important, obviously, and they affect, they affect investors. We've made it repeatedly clear that we absolutely respect the right of local jurisdictions to elaborate their own regulations to ensure that they support labor standards, environmental standards. All right, but health. then in, in that case, tell me about this court of arbitration, which has been one of the big uh, sticking points and has raised red flags. And by the way, a similar court of arbitration uh, is one of the main reasons why there's such blowback against a trade deal between the EU and the United States. First of all, Canada is not the United States, okay? Let's get this clear. If you have problems of doing a deal with the United States, then deal with the United States. This is very, very different. There has to be some kind of a panel to arbitrate obvious conflicts in the event of a government being elected to replace a previous government. Let's say the new government decides there won't be any more pipelines. A previous government had authorized pipelines. Therefore, a previous investor had built a pipeline. That investor built a pipeline with a view, obviously, to ensuring, to expecting that it was going to endure. Now it doesn't endure. So uh, to what extent is that investor entitled to some compensation? I think by customary law anywhere, that's a very reasonable process to have. So how do you do it? You get some neutral panelists, judicial panelists, and you assign them to the case to, to, uh, to come up with a compromise solution. I mean, that is something that is done throughout commercial law and throughout customary human law. All right, let, me bring, it, let me bring in on that point, Yanis Koutsoumidis, uh, uh, who is with us from Hania. Uh, Yanis, your thoughts on this. I know this is one of the things that uh, Germany's highest court is looking yes. at uh, in great detail. Exactly, because the, the solution, this tribunal that has been agreed, is, is a hybrid. Uh, there's no such thing in, uh, in Europe. In Europe, we have the European Court of Justice, uh, we have the courts in Brussels and Luxembourg. So this is a new thing that's coming into play. What I think the best solution would be, but I don't think there is time right now to change the whole thing. The best solution, and we have to see it in the future, because we might expect a similar agreement for Great Britain. I don't think that's out of the question that uh, the UK will, have, will deliver a hard Brexit and there will be a free trade agreement with the UK as well. So there has to be established uh, an, uh, an independent court, like court of arbitrations, which is, I think, is based in Paris, uh, a similar court of trade court between uh, the European Union and the countries that uh, having a free trade agreement with the European Union. And that would be more uh, authority given to this court rather to a panel or a, a tribunal. I think this is, this is a sensitive case, but I think the agreement is open-ended. This is something that can be developed in good faith, in good will, in coming months or coming years. So what's, your religion, on, Canada, uh, what's your religion, Yanis, on signing now or later? I think now it's, it's a momentum is to reach an agreement in the next uh, 36 hours. I don't think there is a political um, patience in many capitals. Also, Prime Minister Trudeau gave a very, very passionate speech in the past few days saying Europe has to deliver on its promises. I think we will disappoint many of our uh, trade partners around the world if we keep kicking the can down the road and keep changing all the agreements that we make with, with the governments. John Evans? Yeah, the problem is we're talking about this if it's a trade agreement. It's not a trade agreement. I think it's an investment agreement. It's a regulation agreement. Now, certainly, why do we have to have a, a special arbitration system when an individual citizen can't actually go to some supranational court and challenge a decision? Why can't a union go and actually raise questions of fundamental labor rights being violated? Why should companies have that right? And why, in many cases, on bilateral investment dispute settlements, it's actually used as a chilling effect on the questions of raising a minimum wage, compensation of environmental regulations? I think there's two other problems with this agreement. 
uh, which are fundamental. One is also the question of the, the limits to regulation this could put in the place and what's meant by the precautionary principle, which the Commission itself has had to try to explain in this, uh, in this subsequent declaration. And the other one is what is actually the area of the public sector. There's a great deal of concern that uh, public service it could be under attack in the, uh, in the agreement. Now, just because Canada is a nice company, country and we all feel that uh, you know, just in Trudeau's doing a good job doesn't mean to say we've got to get into a bad agreement where the investment chapter would last for 20 years if this goes through. So I think those three things have to be channeled, uh, changed. The uh, Commission declaration, which was just introduced a few days ago, tried to give explanations on all three of those issues. If there wasn't a problem, why did they feel they had to do that? They're clearly actually reacting to the, the pressures and the criticism. The issue now is well, what is the problem. legal status? What is the legal status of that document <clears throat> in the future? I Jeremy Kinsman. Question. Well, there's a problem, and the speaker is the problem. I mean, he's speaking from a position of doctrine and ideology, which really doesn't have anything to do with Canada and Europe. I mean, I will hazard our environmental regulations, our minimum wage, our social uh, conscience, our social contract is every bit as robust as we're talking what exists about, I'm sorry, we're talking about three in issues in the agreement, which will then be a blueprint for all future agreements. Yes. There's, not an international, think... there's not an international trade or investment agreement in Europe which has got investor to state arbitration in it. And I think that's absolutely not, toxic. You, you have that's toxic. Many, well, there, there are well, many of those. There are many of those agreements not a in place today. There are many of these agreements in place. I think that the first one was Germany and Pakistan. But in they're 19, bilateral. They're not 19, multilateral. They are multilateral one. There's the Energy Charter Treaty, which is a multilateral treaty. The, I think the key issue is that as suddenly Western states have become not only the the claimant, but suddenly the defender, they suddenly feel that a system that they were very happy to impose on developing countries, i.e. you go to Kazakhstan and it doesn't work, so let's better have an arbitration tribunal, which of course is more neutral than having to go to a court in Kazakhstan, or if you go in your court in New York or in Toronto or in Paris, you're well, never going to get your money. So the fact is, I think it's not about the individual laws. I agree with Mr. Klinsman. I think the issue about this arbitration court is about the transparency and about the myth that are ranking around because it is secret, it has a non-recourse action, right. which all has Trent. a number of real advantages, but it has the problem of a perceived lack of democrat democratic legitimacy. Uh, Yanis Koutsimidis, I want to bring up with you something that uh, uh, Jeremy Kinsman brought up in part one of our discussion, and that is Wallonia, this one region uh, inside of one country among 28, there's still 28, uh, who uh, is able to hold up the agreement. What are your thoughts on that? Should consensus politics uh, be rewritten when it comes to Europe? Well, this is a, a new attempt uh, for Europe to become more democratic, to have the national parliaments and the regions involved. There are another two regions besides Wallonia which have to ratify the agreement. I think it's, it's a positive step. We have to uh, take care of the anxieties of the European citizens that have been feeling that there are decisions taken out of their hands in, in some uh, bureaucratic system in Brussels. I think it's a good procedure, which, but we have to, to grow up from these procedures. The, the national parliaments and the national governments need to realize that we need desperately to have growth and growth can come from trade, new trade, new partnerships around the world. Because the rest of the world is not waiting for Europe to make deals. They're, they're, they're dealing all around the world. They're growing. Uh, China is growing 6.7%. India is growing more than 7%. We have a, a stagnation of growth in Europe. And we need to do all that can, we can to, to enhance the growth and the economy in Europe. So this is a trade agreement that will bring jobs and will bring opportunities to young entrepreneurs to make new partnerships with Canadian companies, to go to North America, to open up business. I think it's a positive step, but I think there will be losers from this. We have to take care of the losers. Like we have uh, seen in, in Great Britain that the losers of the globalization have turned around the country in, in one single vote. 
So there has to be a real discussion of who's losing from this agreement. Is it small business owners? Is it the pensioners? Is it the workers? I don't think the workers <clears throat> have anything to fear. New jobs will bring new opportunities. Right. The pensioners have every reason to have to, to believe in growth in Europe because it will support the social system. The small entrepreneurs have the problem and the small business owners and the national governments need to help the small owners cope with the, with the, with the big competition that will come with this agreement. All right, let me, let me turn now to uh, Socialist Senator Olga Azrian, uh, uh, Vi Vice President of Wallonia's uh, Regional Senate. Thank you for joining us here in the France Bank. I know you were kept by a a vote uh, j just a few minutes ago, so you, uh, you may have missed part of our conversation. But let me just ask you, you just heard Yanis uh, Kutsumidis uh, say this is not going to hurt workers. Your region, uh, high unemployment, uh, industry is hurting. Uh, it's one of those places where there's a lot of blowback against uh, globalization. Do you hear Yanis's arguments? Is the CETA deal a good one? Yes, because uh, most of this you have to add farmers as we have uh, a special type of uh, farming industry, which is more a, a family way and uh, uh, oriented to short, uh, short, short system uh, for food. And uh, of course, if we have to compete with uh, the big farms of uh, Canada, it will be for us a real problem. More to this, uh, we have in the treaty a special point on uh, the protection of the farming in Canada, which we don't have in Europe. So we are just wondering why is this uh, clause not a bilateral one? Uh, among to this, you have to add all the way the disputes can be settled. We have been used in Europe to use the legal and national systems to settle all our disputes. Here we are going to adopt a system which is an international court system uh, which is first very far from the people, and the second point, it is a very expensive one, as it has been proved in other treaties. And uh, if we had to, to give a, a last point, it is the system of what we call regulatory cooperation, which is the way all our standards, uh, which are so important for us, it is really what we call the heart of uh, the consumers' policy, which we have been developing in Europe, is going to be uh, put at stake by the fact that all the standards, as far as social, environmental, and even the labor standards, could be discussed in other places before being proposed or even suggested to the states. So we have the feeling that the first priority is how to make the best investments, how to make the best trade systems and not really taking care of the reality of our economic system today. And, and o Olga, are... let me ask you, the, the leader of your party this is the former prime minister of Belgium, uh, Elio Di Rupo, uh, under pressure. Do you think he's going to change uh, his stance and, and that uh, he could, uh, uh, in the end, agree to all of this? Well, what I've just said, has something changed? No, not really not. We've asked to have added comments and added laws and rules to this treaty, the answer is we cannot change the treaty. The only thing, the only thing we have got was an inter interpretative notice. As it is said, it is a notice. It has no binding commitment in the whole of the treaty, which is totally unacceptable for us. I think uh, having been negotiating for eight years, two years of discussions in our parliament, and now everything should be just set up in eight days, even three days, even one week. Where are we going to do with this? It right, let, me, let, me bring in, let me bring in the former Canadian ambassador to the EU, Jeremy Kinsman. Uh, I, I don't want to go over all the points we discussed in part one, but specifically, uh, what would you answer on the issue of farming? I know livestock farmers in Europe are particularly worried. I, I don't know. I think that we're going to have to accept that we're just living on two different mental planets here. Um, uh, Canada has been, I think, quite outrageously protectionist in some of its agricultural uh, uh, instruments for protecting our dairy farmers, our chicken producers. And as a matter of fact, what this treaty does is break that down. And politically, it's very, very hard for elected Canadian uh, politicians to go to specific regions as the senator is talking about her specific little region in Europe, 
uh, to convince them that there are... Her little region, by the way, has three million citizens. It's not so little. Well, no, but it's three million citizens out of 520 million, right? I know it very well. I have a lot of sympathy for it. But Wallonia has been on the losing end of economic trends for about 80 years. I don't think this has anything to do with Canada. I think it has to do with resentments within Belgium uh, about who is, you know, uh, on top these days and who is hurting the most. We all have we all have tremendous concern about the anxiety, about the anxiety that is being caused to people as a result. Excuse me. That much too easy to use this kind of arguments. I think it's well, not fair. Can I, can I don't I know if it's easy. I don't know if it's easy. It happens to be true. All right, let, let no. me begin. John Evans, very, very briefly. Can I speak up for Wallonia? Because, I mean, many of the same concerns, not specifically on agriculture, but about the question of investment tribunals, the regulatory uh, uh, environment, and the ability to make good environment regulations were all the points which were put forward not just by trade unions, but also by the consumers' associations in Europe and also by the environmental associations. Now, so it's not just Wallonia who's got it wrong. There's a lot of parts of Europe which are deeply concerned about certain elements of the treaty. Yeah. Now, that has to get right. Are it's, you it's concerned, a new type... Mr. Evans? Are no, you I'm, concerned and, and the Canadian arguments, the arguments, uh, the arguments, this is a precedent for the future about precisely companies being able to, whether American, Canadian, elsewhere, <clears> to actually challenge national governments on, on yeah. questions of regulation. I'd say more broadly, yeah. the issue about trying to get trade negotiations back on track, governments need to actually create jobs by getting rid of austerity, by trying to invest in infrastructure, by trying to raise wages. I think there's certain studies that have been done which suggest that agreements like CETA and TTIP put a dampener on wages by actually tilting the power more to companies rather than workers in the international environment. I think that has to get fixed if we're to move into a situation where people have confidence in the, in the trade system again in the future. And by the way, it wasn't a minority in the UK who voted against Brexit, in favour for Brexit. It was actually the majority, unfortunately, who seem to think they are losers in this process. So we've got to get those well, issues right in the future and actually create good jobs. I, but I think there's, but there's an important point, I think, though, which is we are now holding a trade and service agreement responsible for the failure of European states for 30 years to create sustainable growth and to deregulate and to work better in the economies. And, we, and I fear there is, or I feel, there's a blaming going on and it's concentrated on that thing because you hit what you can now get. So I think, I mean, let's, let's not fool ourselves. There has been the closing of a caterpillar factory in Charleroi has been last Thanks. week. So how can you, in the wake of that, not just say, oops, what's happening here? The problem, though, is, the problem is, in my view, is the fundamental inequality that societies have produced. But that inequality is not due to trade or it's not due to globalization. It's due to the fact that our economies on the inside don't work properly. And I yeah, find... Not part of it is due to <clears throat> but, and I find, and I, but I find it's, it's an important... It's the same blaming, shaming, which is the EU with its bureaucratic measures is the problem, etc. I, I personally think the, the treaty is not so bad. What I do think, though, is the way it was negotiated, the way these things are being negotiated, is yeah. in a way that today citizens want more transparency. And I think we're cut in a... In a movement where going forward, we will not negotiate these in the same way. Now, that will put limits on what we can negotiate. The only option B, and that's where I think I do not concur with the Greek colleague, I do not think the fact that national parliaments claw back sovereignty or even regional parliaments from the European Union is per se a good thing. If the European Union had a properly democratic functioning with a proper parliament that could ratify a treaty, there would be no need because you would say it's a proper representation of the European people and by majority vote, right. they can decide what they want. So, uh, yeah, uh, Jakob Hessler making the argument that more Europe, not less, is what's needed. Uh, Olga Zirin. Yes, that's exactly what we say. Uh, what we just examined is that we have a treaty of a new type with new clauses. And what we say that if the things have been done quite properly with a lot of transparency and if the different population would have been put into, uh, into work on these things very clearly, I think things would have been totally different. But as we can admit today that what has been suggested in this treaty is a new pattern 
of negotiations is a new pattern of treaty. We just want to give a new type. And we say this thing about the ICS is not a good idea how to work in Europe and with all our partners, of course, including Canada, with whom we have so good trade relationship. Of course, having this code of regu regulatory processes is not good because what we want is to get the better standards. What we want to have is something which is not so social dumping. So what do we say simply? Please, let's take the time having been negotiating for nearly 10 years, how is it we can take six months more to be sure that everybody, even Germany, who is suspended to the decision of the Constitutional Court, could agree on what is proposed? Right. How is it that uh, other countries each time have to add special protocols, add it to something which is not really binding? Greece with FETA and other things like that. Right, let, so me ask, let me just ask Yanis Koutsoumidis about this and, and about uh, a claim made by John Evans. Uh, is it true that generally free trade agreements dampen growth or do they add growth uh, as a general rule? If we just have a look well, at what, uh, any, trade, what NAFTA has to, done, the result yes. is... Yanis yeah, Koutsoumidis. Yes, well, well, to give you an example, we have, we have regions right. in Greece where unemployment is more than 30%. Uh, a trade agreement would give huge opportunities to, new, to, to Canadian companies and come and invest, and also Greek companies to be able to attract Canadian capital. This is a new future for people that can't afford to have a living right now. So we don't have a luxury of saying, well, we don't like this paragraph, or the other paragraph could have been a bit better, when we have people can't, who can't live on normal circumstances right now in Europe. Europe needs investments, and it's urgent. We have to understand the urgency of some regions of Europe. John Evans? First of all, as I said at the very beginning, uh, certainly the organisations I represent are very much in favour of trade. The question is, is an agreement which gives these sorts of rights to companies and potentially limits good government regulation and potentially opens up parts of the private public sector uh, to uh, private sector investors and subsequently to, uh, to claims in courts. Is where, that the right sort of this? agreement we where need now? We're essentially Mr. trying to get a where? process forward where trade actually contributes to Europe but in the future. That? Jeremy Kinsman. At the same time, it's Jeremy Kinsman. Kinsman. Yeah, better. I, I, just, uh, I just find that the people, this is 2016, okay? It's not 1816. And uh, this is an agreement that is attempting to deal with the intricacies and complexities of the international modern economy today. We in Canada, just as you in Europe, have every preoccupation with absolutely ensuring that people have a voice. Our regulatory system, we would not weaken it for the sake of this treaty, and we don't expect anybody else's regulations to be weakened. There is no specific Yes. entitlement here to corporations to weaken anybody's national regulations or standards in health, environment, or labor. If, if this, that isn't in if the this was an agreement the about issue, raising the standards issue, and regulations. The only issue is if a government, a new government is elected and wishes to change the regulations that affect a prior uh, investment by whoever, then that person, that corporation, that entity is entitled to some form of arbitration. As, as they that would be, uh, that, that entity perfect, now would be perfect, able to use normal. national courts to take uh, is, to take their case in national courts. Anything, anything no, here but, uh, yeah, but about, think, yeah, we, about we should, we should a disposition split. to transfer from the public to the private sector any domain of business or other but activity. We should split. I think we should split, but I think we should split the legal question of how a private sector company would seek compensation. For example, in case, imagine there's a government, A, it privatizes hospitals because it's a government that believes in privatizing hospitals. Now, investors invest in these hospitals. The next government comes four years later and says, actually, we do not believe in private hospitals. We will renationalize them. Any law existing in any country I know 
would say the private investor who invested in good faith in these hospitals when they're being renationalized has a right to be compensated for his losses. That is completely standard procedure within each and every country. Every country is democratically exactly. free to privatize, renationalize, reprivatize how it sees fit. The difference is, is how do you seek compensation? And the International Arbitration Tribunal, what it does, it says, if you seek compensation from the government, you are in Canada, imagine, and it's a European government that has renationalized the hospital you were just buying. You can seek compensation from an independent panel that's neither French nor Canadian, or neither European nor Canadian, but that is independent under the auspices of some type of a World Bank right, logic. We're, we're, That's what the issue is. That is per se neither good nor bad, but we have to discuss that and how much of this we want and how much, if we don't want that, we are ready to invest in an international court system because we cannot. I think it is, it, it is necessary to have some type of supranational system to deal with these, with these disputes. And right. either you create a national UN type international court of commercial justice for investment cases, or you say you have a more flexible system, which is what's proposed now. At the right, let, me, let, me put, let, me put, let me put this to Olga's read, because right now the mood around <laughs> Europe is not for handing more powers uh, to Europe. Uh, so uh, wh what's your prediction going forward? Are we going to headed for uh, more and more gridlock are, and the chance of striking a deal in the future becoming smaller and smaller? Olga's Riem? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't get you. The, the question was, uh, uh, right now we're seeing uh, that uh, the mood is against uh, giving more powers uh, to, the, to uh, uh, the supranational level, Europe-wide. So uh, is it now or never if you want to strike these kinds of deals? No, it's not now or never. It's just let's take the time, make a real transparent procedure let the, the things really be in contact with the real society okay. and not decide anything uh, not top down from, from the commission. That's what the we say. The real society. The real society. None of these elites, I guess we mean, right? Uh, the real, real society. society. The you know, we spent five, we spent five it, years consulting with every possible protected. interest group involved. There could not be more transparency. This is a more complete myth. Of course. How is it that in eight days we got more than you got in eight years? How is it what that you we can change eight days, something we're, we're different? We're unfortunately out of time, so uh, we're going we're gonna to have to leave it there for now. I want to thank you, Olga Zrian, for joining us from uh, La Louvière in Belgium. I want to thank uh, uh, as well uh, the former Canadian ambassador to the Ujerry Kin Kin Kinsman in uh, Victoria, Canada, uh, Yanis Kutsumidis uh, in Hania. I want to thank as well John Evans and Jakob Hessler. Stay with us. Our Media Watch segment is next. And we say hello to James Creedon after a spirited discussion. Uh, he's many, and we were saying it at the outset, uh, we, we heard John Evans say how this deal is a blueprint for those to come. And when we say those to come, the first thing many think of is that deal with the United States, TTIP. That's right. And uh, TTIP has been rejected now by uh, the French, German and Austrian governments. Uh, European countries were essentially uh, supporting the, the deals such as TTIP for a long time. But uh, I think popular pressure meant that there was a, 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 a switch at the end. People power is ending TTIP and other unpopular EU free trade deals, uh, says The Guardian. And even if TTIP has now been sort of put to one side, if you like, a lot of people are essentially saying CETA, this free trade deal between Europe and Canada, uh, is TTIP through the back door. A lot of headlines sort of linking the two, if you like, the Canadian trade deal, which will let in TTIP by the back door. Now, what do people mean by that? This article in politics.co.uk is giving a couple of details. It champions the destruction of rules designed to protect society and the environment. There are huge differences in food safety rules between the EU and Canada, and this deal such as this would mean we, we're going for the lowest common denominator. In other words, less protection for environmental norms or, or uh, 
um, uh, or health norms rather in Europe. Also, worryingly for those who oppose CETA, it includes a cosmetically rebranded uh, version of the corporate court system, which uh, was so controversial in TTIP, uh, which essentially would create a one-way justice system for big business to sue states for lost profits. So these are the points that a lot of people say uh, are just simply uh, not really acceptable. Just to show you a couple of more headlines in that regard, Francois CETA is not the progressive agreement it claims to be. That's on youractive.com. Meanwhile, on social media, you've got uh, many uh, supporting, in fact, uh, mm -hmm. Wallonia. Millions in Europe count on you, Paul Magnette. Stay firm and hashtag stop uh, CETA. You're having the far right in France making similar uh, calls. This is Florian Philippot, the deputy leader of the National Front Party, uh, who is opposing CETA and EU totalitarianism, of course, that's uh, very much in line with National Front uh, anti-EU uh, st uh, an anti-EU stance. But then, this is what's so confusing about it, on the political left, uh, the ecology, uh, ecology um, debut movement, how would you say that, uh, ecology standing up, so they are supporting uh, Walloons as well uh, in their stand against CETA. Others pointing out that countries such as Bulgaria and Romania also have strong reservations against CETA. It's not just uh, the Belgian region of Wallonia. In, in the discussion, uh, Jeremy Kinsman saying that in Canada, many politicians are uh, spending political capital to get this through. Uh, indeed, um, just a one. I mean, there's a, I was fo I'm focusing here more on the, the European aspect of it, but just one article in Counterpunch.org, uh, critical of Justin Trudeau uh, for his stance on this. Uh, despite its sunny ways, the Trudeau government appears to have resorted to bullying and spin to try to get its its way on a controversial trade deal. Uh, the target is the Belgian region of Wallonia, says this article. Uh, and so essentially they're, they're talking about uh, Trudeau being sunny on the outside, but actually having tactics that amount to bullying. Now, obviously, I've only shown you the, uh, the CETA opposition uh, content, which, uh, but social media, if you type in CETA into Twitter or any of these uh, search or social media networks, it's largely stacked against uh, trade, un uh, trade deals such as this. Just, just one word, do you, do you think that Justin Trudeau is able to bully Brussels? I don't think it's going to be bullied. I am rather relaxed. I think it will go through. It will take more time. Few things. It may be reopened, although they say it won't. But that's, it's negotiation of a new style, of a new kind. It's the new reality. We have to accept it. And it'll, I, I, I'm not that skeptical. All right. Something we'll definitely <clears throat> be revisiting. Yeah. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you, James. Thanks, Martha. Thanks for joining us here in the France Vent Get Debate.